Statistics you may not understand, and departments of people you've probably never heard of, are forever changing the way your favorite sports are played. In this video, we'll discuss the origins of the sports analytics movement and how it's affecting strategy on the field and in the front office. Let's dive in! Analytics. You say the word, and immediately sports fans have a reaction, whether positive or negative. From its big breakthrough with Moneyball in Oakland in the late 90s and early 2000s until now, the use of analytics has changed the landscape of sports forever. No longer are the majority of teams evaluating players and making decisions with outdated statistics or by feel and the eye test. Rather, an overwhelming amount of data has been introduced, undoubtedly into every sport that you love, that is giving new insight into what contributes to wins and losses and what makes a player valuable. While analytics were a small part of the sports world prior to this century, the genesis of this modern movement can most simply be traced back to the early 2000s. You've probably heard of the book and or movie Moneyball. It follows the paradigm shifting ways the Oakland Athletics approached team building and how to determine a player value in the early 2000s. With the team on a shoestring budget, their general manager, Billy Bean, wanted to get an edge over the Yankees of the world by reevaluating what determined the value of a player. Heavily influenced by the work of Bill James, who started the Sabre Metrics movement in the late 1970s, and his own predecessor in Oakland, Sandy Alderson, Bean and his team focused on acquiring players with high on-base percentages and slugging percentages, which they found were more closely correlated with scoring runs and talent than the traditional statistic of batting average. By using this to help find undervalued players on the market, the team had an improbable run of success. Just after this, the Red Sox promoted Theo Epstein, who had no traditional baseball background but was Ivy League educated and at the forefront of the sabermetrics craze, to be their general manager. He actually hired Bill James himself as a consultant as well. And just two years later, after Epstein reshaped the roster to fit his sabermetric vision, the Red Sox won their first World Series in 86 years. The success of both the A's and the Red Sox stemmed from asking questions like this. How can we use the information we have to challenge conventional thought and make better decisions that will lead to more success? That's the driving force behind the rise in analytics the past two decades. And the same line of thinking has spilled its way over into the rest of Major League Baseball and the sports world in general. Especially for teams that have competitive disadvantages, whether that be payroll limitations or lack of talent, utilizing and leveraging analytics to create strategies that allow them to score more points, goals, or runs can help give teams a competitive edge they otherwise wouldn't have. And in the big business of sports, teams will take any edge they can get. And using these analytics has been proven to work, so naturally other teams in sports hopped on the bandwagon. Let's take basketball for example. Daryl Morey, who was hired as the general manager of the Houston Rockets in 2007, thought that teams should be shooting way more three-pointers, since the value of making one is 50% greater than a two-pointer. To make the concept extremely simple, even if you only make 33% of your three-pointers, which is a terrible rate, that's just as efficient as shooting 50% from two-point range, obviously not taking into account the amount of fouls drawn and free throws shot. He also correctly pointed out that the corner three, which is closer to the basket than a three-pointer in other areas on the court, is the most efficient shot in basketball, and offensive play should be designed to get open shots in both corners. If you're going to take a two-point shot, it should be close to the basket, since data and intuition both show that a mid-range shot has less chance of going in than one from close range, and it's worth the same amount of points. This is pretty rudimentary analytics, but it hadn't been explored until Mori brought it to the table. The Rockets' success with this strategy, as well as the Warriors taking over the league with arguably the best three-point shooting teams of all time, has effectively killed the mid-range jumper and changed basketball as we know it forever. In recent years, analytics have started to make their way to football as well. To simplify something that has been obvious in all the work done in football analytics, I'll just say this. Taking a look at historical data shows that passing the football is almost always more efficient and effective than running the football, even when taking into account things like position on the field, down in distance, and potential for turnovers. Just think about it this way. The worst qualifying quarterback last season in yards per pass attempt was Nick Foles with 5.9 yards per attempt. The best running back last year in terms of yards per rush was J.K. Dobbins with 5.8 yards per attempt. So even the most inefficient quarterback gets you more yards per play than the most efficient running back. Of course there's caveats about keeping the defense off balance and not throwing when there's five guys in the box, but still. There's also research that shows that play-action passes have similar rates of success whether you're having success running the ball or not. 
which goes against the common trope of establishing the run early to let the play action work later. And these analytics are changing strategy in the NFL. Passing rates continue to climb to all-time highs. So again, conventional wisdom is being challenged, and the games we love are changing on the field as a result of work being done with analytics. If you notice, a lot of the uses of analytics that we immediately think of are in relation to on-field strategy. Shoot the three more in basketball, try to hit the ball farther in golf, hit the ball in the air in baseball, throw the ball more in football. The numbers show these strategies will all be more productive than the alternatives in the long run. These are changes to sports directly attributable to the rise of analytics, and they have an effect on the product we see on the field. But the genesis of the analytical movement in the early 2000s, as we talked about with Billy Bean and the A's, was more about determining player value and trying to get an edge over the competition in player evaluations and team building. That's the other side of analytics that isn't as much in the public eye. It stems from the question that so many teams across all sports want to answer. What information predicts future value and future success? And analytics are used this way every day in the sports world. In baseball, many statistics that build off basic box score stats, like fielding independent pitching and batting average on balls in play, have been created to help separate skill from what is seen as luck. If someone has a hot month, either pitching or hitting, you may be able to tell, based on these underlying stats, that it's all smoke and mirrors, and that the player will come back down to earth soon. These type of stats help separate the emotion from watching a player go on a hot streak and help you be able to tell, objectively, if he's actually performing any better than normal, or if it's just a statistical anomaly. But the majority of information coming to teams across the world that's helping quantify talent and value is from player and ball tracking systems. These systems track player position and ball position to help quantify what we see with our eyes. With this information, teams can more accurately measure the true talent and value of a player, isolated from specific situations and the quality of competition they're going against. For instance, in the NBA, a system called Sport View is used to measure players' positions on the floor at a rate of 24 times per second. It can track player speed throughout a game, separation between the shooter and defender when the shot is released, and much more. This system can show teams that a player that is making a high percentage of his shots may just be getting a lot of open looks, which naturally have a higher success percentage. If defenders start to close on him quicker, he may not be able to keep up his high percentage. Also, someone with a similar make percentage may be a more talented shooter because he's taking and making more difficult shots. In the NFL, player tracking gives us a ton of great info. Using player tracking technology, ESPN's next-gen stats can tell us how far away defenders are from running backs at various points in their rushes. Comparing that to the NFL average and crunching a lot of numbers, we can get a number called expected rushing yards. This helps us find exactly how many yards the average running back would gain in a certain situation, based on the blocking and position of defenders. If a running back gets more than average, presumably this means he's an above-average running back, even if his basic stats don't look great. This helps separate the player and his talent from the situations his teammates put him in. Finally, MLB's StatCast is one of the leaders in publicly consumable player tracking data. It provides a ton of fun stats, like max sprint speed, expected batting average, expected catch probability, and more. Let's say someone hits the ball at 110 miles per hour at a launch angle of 25 degrees, but it gets caught for an out. A fan watching would probably say, man, that ball was hit hard, he just got unlucky. With StatCast, we're able to quantify just how unlucky he got by seeing what the expected batting average for the out was. So again, the common thread for this use of analytics across sports is quantifying what we see with our eyes into numbers. Back to the basketball example, if you talk to a basketball fan, they may notice that a player on their favorite team is hitting a bunch of contested shots. With player tracking info, we can verify if that's actually true, or if the fan is only remembering the made shots and not the missed ones. This helps remove any biases and gives information to the teams, and as they get more and more data and test different theories, they're able, presumably, to hone in more on how to quantify a player's true talent and value. So that's how analytics are changing the sports we love, on the field and off. They're making us reevaluate what strategies teams take to score in the most efficient ways possible, helping us redefine what value is and what a player can control, and quantifying what we see with our eyes. While people may not like the removal of feel and instinct that comes with quantifying everything with numbers, analytics effects on sports is undeniable. One more thing before we go. Do you think the result of analytics effects on the field is fun to watch? I've already covered this in our previous baseball video, but for some sports, it's kind of ruining the aesthetics of the game. Baseball is as boring as it's ever been, 
largely thanks to the changes brought about by findings from analytics. On the other hand, football is as exciting as it's ever been, as more and more teams decide to pass the ball more and go for it on fourth down at a higher rate. So it's kind of a mixed bag. If you want to hear more discussion about this, we'll get into it more next week on Double Take. So keep an eye out for that and ring the bell to get notified when that video drops. But for now, what do you think about analytics and sports? Do you love them? Do you hate them? Leave a like and a comment either way to let us know how you feel, and we'll be sure to respond. Until next time, we'll see you.